Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new chair and new community for the Ask Historian Conference. We all want to be remembered after we go, but few of us manage the kind of achievements that might make our name stick out in the historical records. For some, although it's not the lack of achievements sort of problem, history is full of forgotten figures who profoundly shaped the world around them, but whose memory has faded or been actively removed by those who came after. This panel will explore how politics, genders, and race have shaped the historical records and their determine with names we know remember. I'm Nicholas, and I'm the archivist of Emmaus International. I have a master's degree in medieval history from the University of Lille in France, and my research explores the political and military turmoil in France during the 14th and 15th century through the lens of financial records, administrative documents, and so on. So before we begin this session, however, we would like to acknowledge that the Ask Historians Digital Conference is taking place on the ancestral, unceded, and treaty territories of many indigenous people who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We offer our gratitude to these people and recognize that colonial nations continue to benefit from the brutalities that enabled the original settlers, colonizers, to seize these lands. The AHDC organizers acknowledge both the land upon which we are virtually hosting this conference and the deep-rooted and long-lasting arms caused by white imperialism and settler colonialism. We invite you to read our full land acknowledgement in our video description below. Andrew Kenrick is a doctoral candidate at the University of East Anglia in Norfolk, England. His research seeks to find new ways to write biographies of ancient characters. He is currently writing about the first century Roman client King Juba II of Mauritania. He has worked as an archaeologist, an archivist, and an editor. He is also co-editor of the non-fiction magazine Interland. And he will talk now about Rome, Rome's African king Juba II of Mauritania. Juba II of Mauritania is one of the most important yet overlooked figures of the first century BC. He was born a Berber, raised a Roman and died a king. He was a confidant of the first emperor Augustus, childhood companion to the second emperor Tiberius, son-in-law to Antony and Cleopatra, a scholar, an explorer, a diplomat. Yet he's rarely, if at all, mentioned except on the fringes of the biographies of other more famous Romans. But before we delve into why Juba is so important, we need to rewind to the middle of the first century BC and Caesar's civil war with his arch rival Pompey. Both Caesar and Pompey had allies in North Africa. Um, Pompey was allied to Juba's father, Juba I of Numidia, which is a kingdom roughly um, analogous to modern day Algeria and Tunisia. After Caesar won, Juba I committed suicide and his family were captured and baby Juba II was paraded through Rome as part of Caesar's African triumph in 46 BC. What happened next is unusual for the time. Hostages were normally enslaved, exiled or killed, but instead Juba II was adopted into Caesar's family and raised by one of Caesar's female relatives, probably his niece Octavia. Fifteen years later we find ourselves in the midst of another Roman civil war, this time between Caesar's heir Octavian, the future Emperor Augustus, and Antony and Cleopatra. After Antony and Cleopatra's defeat, they both committed suicide, Cleopatra hoping to avoid being paraded as a trophy. Their 10-year-old twins, Cleopatra Selene and Alexander Helios, didn't escape this fate and were captured and paraded through Rome as part of Octavian's Egyptian triumph. Selene was then adopted into Octavian's family and raised by his sister Octavia, who by this time had a huge family, including her own children with Antony, as well as Antony's children from his first marriage. But as far as we can tell, both Juba and Selene were treated no differently to the rest of her children, and Octavian eventually um, officially adopted Juba. The proof of this comes from his full name, Gaius Julius Juba. Eventually, Octavia arranged a marriage between Juba and Cleopatra Selene, and in 25 BC, Augustus installed them as king and queen of Mauritania. Somewhat confusingly, this is not the modern day country of the same name, but an area roughly where Morocco and Algeria are today. The reason Augustus was able to do this was because the previous king of Mauritania had died without issue and left his kingdom to Rome in his will. Elsewhere, Numidia and Egypt, Juba and Selene's ancestral lands, we're now firmly in the hands of Rome itself, so this was seen as the next best thing. So why is Juba significant? He was friends with the first two Roman emperors. He was adopted by Augustus and grew up alongside Tiberius, and as far as we can tell he had a close relationship with both of them, at least in his youth. Juba went on campaign with them too, possibly to Greece in the war against Antony and Cleopatra, 
where he may have been present at Actium, which might have proven a somewhat awkward subject to raise with his wife, given that it was the site of the defeat of her parents. He was definitely with Augustus during his conquest of Spain, which we know because at the end of this campaign, for his part in the fighting, Augustus granted Juba the kingdom of Mauritania. Augustus also trusted Juba's skills as a diplomat. In AD 1, Augustus sent the king to accompany his adopted son on his expedition to the east, where Juba offered Gaius Caesar counsel and acted as a mentor during the negotiations following the death of King Herod of Judea. Secondly, Juba was renowned as a scholar king. He was an enthusiastic, wide-ranging academic. He wrote books on all manner of topics, archaeology, history, theatre, botany, poetry, the geography and natural history of Arabia and North Africa, much more besides. Unfortunately, none of his works have survived intact, but fragments have come down to us because authors like Pliny the Elder or the geographer Strabo preserved some of his writing in their own works, sometimes crediting Juba as their source. But because his work has been so neatly subsumed and, dare I say, plagiarised by successive authors, its origin with Juba has become obscured. However, a number of 20th century scholars have painstakingly unpicked his work from ancient sources, but we still only have tantalising fragments of what was once a rich catalogue. Juba didn't conduct his research solely from the comfort of his, of his library, however. He was also an explorer, mounting a number of expeditions both south of his own kingdom and further afield. He's credited with the discovery of the Canary Islands, and he believed he had found the source of the Nile in the Atlas Mountains. He hadn't, of course, but he did find a lake full of crocodiles, and he brought one of them home as proof. Finally, Juba was a patron of the arts. He was an enthusiastic consumer of Roman and Greek culture, a love born from his childhood in Rome. Archaeologists have found a great number of statues in his capital of Caesarea, dating to his rule. Some of these are amongst the finest known examples of Roman sculpture, not just from North Africa, but from anywhere in the Roman world. While Juba imported fine art from elsewhere, he also commissioned his own artists. We have literary evidence for court artists, amongst them Nios, who was a renowned gem cutter based in Juba's capital for a time. A carnelian gem signed by Nios and now in the Met in New York almost certainly depicts Juba's wife, Cleopatra Selene. The poet Crinagoras also lived in Juba's capital for a time too. Two of his epigrams commemorate Juba and Selene's marriage, as well as Selene's death. Juba wrote his own poetry as well, although we only have passing references to that. Of all the arts, Juba was most passionate about the theatre. The theatre built by him in, in Caesarea is the earliest example of an Italian-style theatre found anywhere outside of Rome. And one of Juba's aforementioned poems supposedly poked fun at his court tragedian. So obviously original plays were being written there too. So with us all in mind, why is Juba so often overlooked? So it could be because Juba, who was ethnically Berber, does not fit our modern perceptions of Rome, which is essentially as a, a white empire. Uh, it could be because Juba is eclipsed by the shadows of more famous men. He has the misfortune or fortune to occupy the orbits of famous Romans such as Caesar or Augustus. And as a result, his own story tends to be overshadowed. Or is it because his kingdom was short-lived? Uh, it only lasted for a generation after his own death, ending when his own son and successor Ptolemy was murdered by the Emperor Caligula. Or it's more likely that because the Kingdom of Mauritania is on the fringes of the Roman world, it's traditionally been ignored by scholars operating in the West. Many of the most important artefacts associated with Juba's reign remain in museums in North Africa, making it relatively easy for Western-based writers to ignore them. The very fact I've referred to Mauritania as being on the fringes of the Roman Empire, when it was actually a thriving cosmopolitan kingdom, gives you an idea of the unconscious biases we're up against when studying this period. And all that's to say nothing about his wife, Cleopatra Selene, who is every bit as fascinating a figure as her husband. But due to the pressures of time has been deleted from this talk, as surely as both Juba and Selene have been deleted from history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And now our next speaker is uh, Jessica Arbon. She's an undergraduate student reading history at Magdalen College, University of Oxford. England. Currently, she is researching for a thesis upon which this abstract is based, which seeks to investigate how silence can impact upon the legacy of marginalized early modern individuals. Her research is centered about written forms from 17th and 18th century Britain and Europe, particularly looking at how absence can be used to reconstruct alternative narratives to those generated from writing itself. And a paper will be how oh, silences are written into history and how oh, or oh, whether they should be written out of it. The case of Katrin Reed. Gainsborough, Reynolds, Romney, Van Dyck. For anyone possessing knowledge of the 18th century, portraiture, or European art more generally, 
These names bring to mind images of grand master artists working in upmarket studios, painting the most illustrious of sitters. However, the name Catherine Reed conjures no such an image. Even among art experts, her work is unfamiliar. In 1751, however, her portraiture was described by the Secretariat to the Pretender, Andrew Lumisden, to be thought little inferior to Van Dyck himself. Indeed, Reed was renowned as an illustrious artist in her day, recognised as paintress to the Queen and keenly sought after by nobles across Europe. We must ask then, why does the name Catherine Reed mean nothing to us now? Why is it that the names of artists with whom we are most familiar are overwhelmingly male? What caused Catherine Reed to fall from such heights of fame? And what can we do or what should we do to rescue her from oblivion? Before looking at how Catherine Reed's been deleted from history, um, it stands that a brief biography of her life must first be given. Catherine Reed was born to Alexander Reed of Turfberg and Elizabeth Wedderburn on the 3rd of February, 1723. She was the fifth of 13 children in the family of Scottish nobles. Little's known about her, her, her early life, but it's likely that her upbringing was influenced by the strong Jacobite sympathies of her family. This cost her uncle his life after his involvement in the failed Jacobite uprising of 1745 and continued for many years to play a key role in her artistic career. Around the time of the failed uprising, Reed headed to exile in France alongside numerous other Scottish Jacobite sympathisers, two being close friends of hers, Isabella and Andrew Lumisden, of whom she executed her first known portraits. In France, she trained under the French pastelist Maurice Quentin de la Tour, a man whom she referred to as her master. However, little else is known about her time there, and in 1751 she left for Rome. Although a common rite of passage for young men at the time, this was an exceptional journey for a young woman to make, especially as she went alone. Rome is where Catherine Reed transformed from a little known Scottish lady to a prominent pastoralist, dubbed by contemporaries as the English Rosalba. This serves as a tribute to the esteemed Italian portrait artist Rosalba Carriera, whom Reed was seen to succeed, and therefore testifies to her involvement in a legacy of esteemed female artists. Although exceptional, Reed was certainly not the first, nor the only female artist of her time. In Rome, she briefly trained under the French portrait artist Louise Gabrielle Blanchet, at which time she befriended the Abbe Peter Grant, a man of close Jacobite connections who helped her to foster a network of vital artistic linkages. Through him, she acquired the patron Cardinal Albani, known within Italy as the Prince of Connoisseurs, who not only introduced her to high status individuals, but also opened up his own pictures for her to copy. Through this process of befriending, copying and painting new sitters, Reed honed her skills, and as she herself wrote in an unpublished letter to her brother, Captain Alexander of Logie, in January of 1752, she had begun to attract the notice of the Italians, among whom she rapidly attracted a large clientele made up of some of the highest ranking members of society. Indeed, later in the same letter, Reed declares how she had the honour to be the first from our island that ever painted an Italian above the rank of priest or abbe, whereas I have painted the very first princess in Rome. This both illustrates the high esteem by which she was held among the Italian nobility and positions her at the forefront of artistic talent in Britain, to whence she returned in 1753. The addresses that she lived at in London allow us to trace the upward progress that she made in society, moving St James's Place upmarket in 1766 to Germain Street before settling in Welbeck Street between 1771 and 1776. During this period, she exhibited her work both at the Free Society and the Society of Artists before moving to the New Royal Academy where she exhibited a handful more works during the 1770s. At this time, she was charging between 30 and 150 guineas for her portraits which translates to £5,000 to £25,000 in modern money. The fame and fortune that she enjoyed can also be glimpsed at in surviving testimonies made by her contemporaries, which suggest that she was seen as a highly esteemed figure. For example, English noblewoman Elizabeth Carter wrote to Mrs Montague in 1761 of a portrait by Catherine Reed of a child, which she claimed was so much alive as to make the rest of the exhibition appear mere pictures. In 1764, the English newspaper, The Daily New Advertiser, records how Miss Reed was made painter in crayons to Her Majesty, 
describing her as celebrated in an article published the following year described to have had the princesses Louisa and Caroline sitting to her for their portraits in crayon. However, only a few years later, there are indications that Reed's status began to decline. And at this point, her recoil into anonymity begins to start. In May of 1768, the Scots magazine describes a painting exhibited by Reed at the Great Room of Spring Garden, Charing Cross, with the rather backhanded statement, we have seen much better crayon paintings by this ingenious lady. Similarly, a diary entry for the 8th of June in 1773, James Beattie describes Reed's painting as delicate but of no strong expression in comparison to her niece, Helena Beatson, whom he declared promises an extraordinary genius. It's shortly after this point that Reed made the decision to travel to India, a voyage which she undertook with Helena and two of her brothers in 1777. The art historian Neil Je Jeffries has attributed her reasons for the trip to possibly including a decline in popularity. Indeed, it certainly appears that Britain was looking for a new generation of artists, and a critic in the London Courant of 1782 shows how Reed was swiftly replaced by Margaret King after passing away in 1778. Stand aside, Miss Reed, it declares. The true silencing of her legacy, however, occurred during the two centuries after her death. Marjorie Morgan, one of the few scholars to have paid Reed attention during the past decade, notes how she was already in doubtful resonance by 1809. This can be seen by the fact that from her death to the mid 1820s, there's no mention of Catherine Reed in any surviving public documents that I've been able to find. She was excluded from dictionaries of painters, only mentioned in later revised versions that appear from the latter half of the 19th century. References as she is in these later dictionaries, her extensive artwork and fame was never given adequate attention. No catalogue of her work was produced and portraits by her came to be attributed to other artists, namely Joshua Reynolds, or were simply deemed to have been anonymous. By the mid 19th century, therefore, Catherine Reed had thus been completely lost from the public sphere. Her name was no longer uttered by people. Where commemorative exhibitions were made of her male counterparts' works after their deaths, her paintings lay in private collections owned by her family. Her voice was essentially privatised too, kept by her descendants in unpublished private possession and not donated to the archives, thus subject to the will of what her family chose to preserve for posterity. Thus it is perhaps no wonder that her works were posthumously attributed to the contemporary Reynolds. With her name no longer spoken within the art world and her works no longer hanging upon gallery walls, the physical reminder of her contribution to Britain's portraiture, her descent into obscurity must have been fairly seamless. Indeed, even now that her paintings have been restored to her, some scholars maintain that her style and poses owe much to the innovation of her male counterparts. This in itself perpetuates the tendency of art history to diminish the significance of women artists by presenting them as mere imitators of their male contemporaries, which fails to acknowledge the inspiration and influence that was and continues to be shared between members of both sexes within Europe's artistic community. Having said all of this, it's shown how easily Catherine Reed, the pioneering female portrait artist of her time, slipped into historical oblivion. I must end by saying that the biggest service that can be done to her is keeping her name on our lips. Only by keeping her alive among the public can her legacy be maintained and her silencing acknowledged yet overcome. Thank you very much, Jessica. And our next speaker is Daniel von Wagner. Daniel von Wagner is a special collection librarian and archivist at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library at the University of Toronto. She holds a BA in European Studies and an MA in Art and Visual Culture from the University of Guelph and a Master of Information in Archives and Records Management from the University of Toronto. Her research interests include the archive of ordinary people in the 19th and 20th century, women in war and under acknowledged female artists. A uh, paper will be the tale of two Suzanne's rediscovering a 20th century bookbinder. Buried in the archives of the Canadian bookbinder, Douglas Duncan, located at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library at the University of Toronto, was something unexpected. A small envelope labeled Mademoiselle Roussy's End Papers. Inside were 36 beautiful hand painted or hand stamped scraps of paper in the Art Deco style intended to function as samples for the inside covers of specialty high-end printed books. Each was embossed with Atelier de Art, Suzanne Roussy, 38 Key Henri, Paris. 
Duncan, who held these samples in his possession, had learned the art of bookbinding in the 1920s and 30s in Paris, and it socialized with a broad literary and artistic circle during that time. The scraps and their provenance provided a name, a place, and a range of dates for this artist. An exciting find is within the field of bookbinding, book arts, and the decorative arts, the individual work of women often goes unnamed and unaccredited, especially as bindings and endpapers are almost never signed or acknowledged in the pages of the book. And it is very common for the work to be attributed solely to larger workshops or presses, which are most often the arena of men. Initial research sources identified the artist as the Franco-Caribbean surrealist writer and philosopher, Suzanne Roussy Cezanne, who wrote on issues of black identity, colonialism, and assimilation. Robin D. Kelly asserted in his book, Black, Brown, and Beige, Surrealist Writings from Africa and the Diaspora in 2009, that Roussy had been, quote, employed in the bookbinding department of a small private press, Harrison of Paris, unquote, when she first arrived in Paris from Martinique, the study beginning in 1934, prior to her marriage to Aimé César. This assertion was repeated in other academic sources and echoed in the only institutional holding of Rousset's bookbinding efforts, the Musée de Beaux-Arts de la Ville de Paris, who lists the place of birth for the artist as Martinique and her dates of birth and death as 1915 to 1963, the same as the surrealist writer. However, I began to question this identification almost immediately. Hugh D. Ford's 1975 book, published in Paris, a chronicle of American and British writers and publishers operating in Paris between 1920 and 1939, confirms that Suzanne Roussy did work for the American-owned private press Harrison of Paris and was responsible for the binding of at least one of their 13 known imprints. Specifically, their 1930 edition of Shakespeare, Venus and Adonis, which was, quote, bound in boards, hand decorated by Suzanne Roussy, with black parchment backs and aluminum tops, unquote. Yet this book was published when Roussy César was only 15 years old and still attending secondary school in Martinique. Similarly, the Musée de Beaux-Arts de la Ville de Paris records the provenance of their book bound by Roussy, a hand-painted and etched out of leather and wood copy of Pierre Loti's Japonaise d'Automne as being acquired from the Salon of the Society of the Decorative Artists in March, 1919, yet states on the same page that the artist who created it was born in 1915, when Roussy César was only four years old. An in-depth analysis of Parisian art journals and cultural periodicals reveal that A. Suzanne Roussy steadily exhibited book bindings and paper designs, wallpapers, and decorative cushions from 1918 until 1937. These two previously discussed bound books and references from the period stand as evidence that it is impossible for Suzanne Roussy César to be the creator of these works. The result is that two women, exceptionally accomplished in their own fields, but vastly different in race, occupation, class, and age, yet who happen to have the same name, have been conflated and merged by scholars and museum professionals, despite obvious and legitimate evidence which demonstrates that there were two separate women working at different times and in different places. Regardless, the result is that one woman, the decorative artist, has been erased from contemporary scholarship and her work, talent, and success has been stripped from her. Piecing together the life of the decorative artist, Suzanne Roussy, is like putting together a puzzle with half the pieces missing. Parisian periodicals in both French and English reveal snippets of her professional career. Her first located reference is in an issue of La Revue Hebdomadaire from 1918, which lists her as a student in the studio of Mademoiselle de Felice, and exhibiting decorated book bindings at the Museum of Decorative Art at the Pavilion de Masson. Her teacher, Marguerite de Felice, was a well-known bookbinder, decorative artist, and furniture designer who began her career first as a leather worker focused on furniture. But during the years of the First World War, large quantities of leather proved to be difficult to obtain, and when Roussy became her student, de Felice had redirected her efforts to leather etching, inlaid book binding, and the decoration of end papers both of which she passed on to her student. Interestingly, Roussy also occasionally worked in leather household goods, exhibiting leather cushions as a part of the Art Deco interior rooms at the 1925 Paris exhibition, suggesting that De Felice's earlier skills had also been a part of her education. Roussy exhibited frequently in the 1920s, often alongside her teacher and mentor, and participated in the salons of the Society of the Decorative Artists between at least 1920 and 1926, and exhibited frequently at the Galleria Museum. Critics and reviewers of her work speak highly of her, 
referring to her as talented and an excellent engraver and designer. In 1918, the French critic Leon Veillat referred to her as among the most gifted of the female bookbinders working in Paris. Even though there are references to her work in exhibition history, Roussy, like many female decorative artists during that period, received very little attention or comment from the mainstream art community, especially since her mentor had also been a woman. As such, there are no sources that provide details of her life, like where she was born, her education beyond that of De Felice, or even her dates of birth and death, as one might expect to find for such an established artist. Researching the address stamped on the back of her end papers, 38 Guy Henri, I was able to find records of Roussy's father, Dr. Bautiste Roussy, a doctor, an entomologist, and a champion of education for women. He was made a Knight of the Legion of Honor in 1908 and promoted to an officer in 1917. His file with the Legion of Honor archive includes his 1926 funeral card, which provides the name of his six daughters, of which Suzanne was the oldest. At the time of his death, his three oldest daughters were unmarried and were listed by their occupation. Suzanne was a member of the Society of Decorative Artists, while two of Suzanne's sisters, Yvonne and Therese, were studying to be doctors. This is demonstrative that Bautiste's commitment to the education of women had truly begun at home, especially as Suzanne operated her art studio out of the family address. The city archives of Paris hold all the information, birth, marriage, death, burial, that one needs to track down a lost Parisian bookbinder. However, the records are not searchable and are listed separately by year for each of the 20 districts of Paris. A long search revealed the building blocks of her life. First, her marriage to Victor Louis, a 43-year-old engineer on the 8th of March, 1932, where she is listed as Suzanne Victoria Anne-Marie Jean Roussy, 36 years old and the daughter of Bautiste Roussy and Marguerite Ferrand. While the certificate states that she has no profession, she has written beside the signature on her document, artist decorator. Her birth record provides her place of birth as the fourth district of Paris and the date as the 3rd of May, 1895. Finally, her death record reports that she passed away on the 19th of September, 1958 at the age of 63, where she is again recorded as having no profession. These basic details are now known, but great swaths of her life remain hidden. For example, while she did continue to exhibit up until 1937, five years after her marriage, her artistic career appeared to have ended shortly before the onset of the Second World War, with no periodical references to her work after 1937. It is unknown how many books exist on shelves in libraries, museums, and private collections with bindings or end papers designed or hand created by Suzanne Murphy. As so far, I have identified only four. However, her career, which spanned at least 19 years, certainly created far more. 36 scraps of beautiful paper found in the unrelated archival collection of a Canadian bookbinder has revealed the life of not one, but two women, both named Suzanne Roussy, who were talented and significant in their own right and deserve to be remembered as separate individuals. Suzanne Victoria Anne Marie Jean Roussy, 1895 to 1958, was a decorative artist, a bookbinder, and accomplished in her field. Like so many female artists, she was forgotten and her work deemed largely insignificant, and even worse, her accomplishments had been stripped from her and given to another. Through the creative use of archives and periodicals, her life and career have been partially reconstructed. This was an opportunity to both identify a high-end bookbinder and decorative artist, and to add a name to the annals of bibliographic history and book history, who are now eager to discuss the labor of women in the creation of books, and to also reclaim a lost female artist and pay tribute to her work. This research, however, is not finished, and I plan on continuing my search to find more about her life and to identify her art. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, all of you three, for those uh, exciting papers. And uh, so now we'll start to discuss a bit about everything you've said to us. I will start with a question that might be um, directed uh, more specifically to Andrew and Jessica, but Daniel can uh, intervene in, in it too, of course. So uh, both Catherine Reed and Juba were the children of people who happened to be on the losing sides of a civil war. Um, did their political background and maybe their exile uh, play a role in their disappearance or was it rather an opportunity to have been on the wrong side of a civil war? So in the case of Catherine Reed, her exile actually benefited her because it gave her access to patrons and 
through her Jacobite connections, um, she came into contact with more people who were closely tied to her family that gave her access to other artists, other artwork to copy. Um, and it actually benefited her as she was also enabled to have a little more freedom as she was almost at like an alternate court. She wasn't in the central court of the country that could be supervised more closely um, where men were more likely to be patronized rather than women. So in the case of her, it was actually a beneficial thing. Yeah, and I agree actually the same, the same is true for Juba. I mean, it, may, it might sound crass to put it this way, but for Juba, it was definitely an opportunity. The classical sources kind of thought so too. Plutarch refers to him as the most fortunate captive ever taken, which I mean is exactly quite a crude way of putting it. But I think um, in the case of Juba, he was reborn effectively at the center of this new power. He was at the heart of Augustus's new regime. He was afforded opportunities that he probably wouldn't have done had he remained as, as heir to the throne of Numidia. I mean, that's not to say Numidia itself uh, was, was any sort of backwater. It was a thriving Hellenistic kingdom in its own right, but it certainly wouldn't have afforded Juba the opportunities that being raised um, in Rome did, you know, being steeped in all the kind of uh, scholarship and education that he got um, as part of the imperial family. So yeah, for, for Juba, it was definitely, it was no bad thing necessarily being on the losing side. Uh, Cleopatra Selene, kind of same sort of answer in some respects. She's, um, uh, in some respects, she gets... Her survival is down to being used as a piece of propaganda to where Augustus can show his clemency by uh, showing, oh, look, look how generous I'm treating the, the children of my defeated foes. That's another point for Catherine Reed, actually. Um, the country that she was in, so the fact that she went into exile in France, um, they had a better approach to female artists there. So um, the French court was actually a more positive environment for them to learn. It was more acceptable for them to be taught how to paint. So that definitely benefited her. Which is uh, coming in, in France and the specific approach of uh, Parisian life and uh, more generally French uh, approach to female artists seems to have benefited uh, Suzanne Roussy too, but even if she was not remembered for it. For it but do you feel there is something specific in uh, Parisian life or French life too for Suzanne Roussy to have been able to uh, to express herself or and to accede to, to success? Yeah, so um, I think the fact that Paris was just such a large um, sort of location where so many books were created and the decorative arts were really embraced sort of in the 1920s and the 1930s, especially with the sort of burgeoning of the success of Art Deco, which really sort of exploded during that period in which Suzanne Roussy was very involved. Um, so I think just the sort of sheer largeness of that sort of industry really helped there in that she was able to get a lot of work. She was able to do a lot of exhibitions. She was mentioned in the periodicals, but at the same time, you know, it wasn't considered high art. Uh, you know, her works aren't signed. So in that way, she was able to work, but she was considered, I would say, more sort of like a working artist or a craftsperson rather than an artist, which really allowed her to sort of be forgotten once she stopped working. Which is a, a common theme with, uh, with uh, Jessica, who uh, explained to us that uh, once uh, Catherine stopped walking or became to lose a bit of uh, momentum and status, she disappeared rather quickly. Um, Maybe, do you think there is the same system or, or similarity between the two on that regard? I think so. Um, there was also mention that Catherine Reed wasn't able to produce history paintings, um, which were seen as like the highest form of fine art, and that was because of her gender. Um, so that would have been a key way for her to be memorialised after her death. So the fact that she was confined to portrait painting, which was kind of restricted as a female form of art and almost considered a lesser form of fine art. So along the same lines as lower, more um, like practical rather than very refined forms of artwork, that meant that she wasn't remembered in the same way as her male contemporaries were. Okay, so the impact, you feel there is an, an impact on the form of art with it, whether it is portrait painting or bookbinding, that lessens a bit their their, their imprint, their their ability to um, 
to be remembered now. Yeah, definitely. Um, also because names are less likely to be um, remembered when it's f forms of artwork that aren't like large signed paintings. There's also mention of how her paintings when they were exhibited were um, confined to corners in exhibitions. She wasn't left centre stage. So even supposedly small acts like that are going to play a role in whether she was remembered by contemporaries or not. Okay, thank you. And though um, this discussion about artists in a lesser form of arts, so to speak, uh, do you think that, uh, and it applies to Joubert too, do you think that the fact that Catherine Reed and Suzanne Roussy were artists, Juba was an artist himself too, and a patron of the art in general. Do you think that being an artist or being associated with the artistic world is more likely to make you disappear from history? Do you feel that being an artist makes you more vulnerable to marginalization and deletion from history, more so than say a conqueror or a great politician known for, known for a big legislative um, work. Do you think that the artistic world in general is more vulnerable to those phenomena? Absolutely. So I think, you know, when you're an artist, your success and your reception and how you're discussed both while you're alive and after you're dead, you know, for decades or centuries, really relies heavily on what the art scene of the time that you were living how they spoke about you, how they discussed you, how your work was exhibited, how it was purchased, um, and the value that it was given at that time. So if you were not given a lot of success during that time, or you were not written about, or you didn't have sort of a circle of artists that you were involved with, because a lot of the times when we hear about artists, we hear about, you know, groups of artists or, you know, circles of artists, and they are sort of remembered as a group. Um, even if, you know, some of them were really successful, maybe some of them were less, but they were included because they were members of that group. Um, so I think when you exist outside of that, as Suzanne Rusi did, you are far less likely, you're far more likely to be forgotten. And I think especially in the case of Rusi was that her mentor was also a woman. I think that if her mentor had been a man, the situation may have been different. Like when I was going through the periodicals in the French newspapers, the men bookbinders and the men decorative artists were discussed much more frequently. Their art was described, their art was often illustrated. Um, there was discussion of their art being purchased and their students are also discussed far more uh, sort of by default. So I think had she had a much more successful, you know, sort of male sort of mentor that, that, that also her reception may have been different. That's an interesting point, because with regards to Catherine Reed, the fact that her mentors, well, two of them were male, it's meant that her own artwork has been ascribed more so to them. So rather than her cultivating her own style, she's been said to have just copied what her male contemporaries were doing. So I think it actually conversely worked against her. But with regards to whether artists are more likely to disappear, I think that, that also ties to just trends in historiography. So the fact that conventional history focused more on politics and um, wars and things like that, it's meant that less attention has been paid to artwork. And then when culture came to the centre of historical investigation, it started off at kind of like the, back, uh, the very bare bones of gender again, and then it's moving into studies of race and we're eventually now moving into studies of sexuality and it takes time for almost the study of history to catch up and start to recognize where there are these gaps so i think that to some extent explains why these people are still um so-called missing i think it's, yeah i think it's a really fascinating question in juba's case i mean the fact that he's remembered at all is pretty less or forgotten at all is, is, is less to do with him being an artist and more to do with him being a king. Um, you know, the, the artists that he's uh, the patron to, their, their names have all been forgotten. Uh, we don't know any of the names of the sculptors. Um, the only person we know the name of is, is Nios, and that's only because he, sh he, he um, signed the gem, and that's quite a rare case. Um, but I don't think in, in uh, Juba's case, it's particularly the fact he's an artist that made him vulnerable to, to kind of that excision from history, it's, uh, it's just kind of bad luck in some respects. You know, his, his writing no longer exists in any uh, substantial form, and that's just bad luck as to what has and hasn't survived from the classical world. I still hope 
hold out hope that somewhere in a you know jar in a de in the desert there might be a you know remaining papyrus manuscript of his autobiography for example but you know it, that's that's down to pure happenstance um uh, but I think conversely Jibra as a pa as a patron of the arts has allowed us to kind of maintain a hold on him as and his kingdom uh, because we have this incredibly rich collection of material that he himself curated or commissioned but of course in the same way that he gets obscured by more famous figures in history he in turn obscures the kind of artists who, who contributed to this work so we don't really know who who they are and I think definitely in in, in terms of ancient art it's, it's very easy to lose the artists themselves okay thank you very much I, I just want to, to go on a bit on the um, artist uh, as opposed to, say, a conqueror. Um, do you think, uh, because you mentioned that uh, we do not have any remains of uh, Juba's work and uh, we do not have much remains of, um, of Suzanne's work either. And do you feel that maybe an artist is more vulnerable to the disparition of its remain of his remains or what the traces he can leave in history, whether as opposed to um, a conqueror who will be remembered even if no material sources or no material things of him uh, do exist, except of course of uh, chronicles and all. But do you feel that um, relying on the, in a way, production of something makes you more exposed to uh, the, disappear the disappearance we're discussing? It certainly puts you down to the whims of uh, what survives and what doesn't survive, especially when we're talking about, um, you know, artwork that's 2,000 years old, that the, how does the writing survive down to, a, you know, over that time, it's a lot of it is luck as to what gets transmitted uh, via the Renaissance and, and, and so on and so forth. And in some respects, I guess, you know, if, if the artist is creating physical work, then that that puts them in the realms of, of the danger of that being lost or destroyed or um, abandoned over the years, uh, not even to go into the fact that, you know, the name that's attributed to a piece of art can, can easily become separated from it, as, as um, Danielle was talking about. But then equally, a conqueror, they're at the mercy of historians to record that victory. If there's no physical evidence of it, and no historian writes it down, is that also lost to us? There's uh, Juba, as well as being an artist, does, he is involved in wars, he's, he's involved in battles. He fights a long-running insurgency against... Um, rebels and insurgents in North Africa, which he, for which he gets very little credit because the credit goes to governors and um, Romans, basically, Roman generals. So again, it, it's very easy for, especially when talking about Asian figures, for their kind of names to be lost, both when you're talking about artwork or victories on the battlefield. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So I think uh, in the case of Suzanne Rizzi, like. You know, I, you know, as I've said already, she wasn't sort of a traditional artist and how her material has sort of survived to this day has really been dependent upon sort of the presses that she worked with. So for example, Harrison of Paris, which, you know, is sort of really the only contemporary acknowledgement of her as a bookbinder that isn't attributed to uh, Russie César is likely because that was a very large sort of American uh, press. And so that, so have her name associated with that, you know, we're able to link that she did make this book and that it's possible that she made other books with them as well. And that, you know, sort of archival crumbs may exist that I could look into further to sort of delve into that further. But, you know, with other books and with books that she was doing individually that were more about the bindings rather than about actually, you know, she was making bindings for more art's sake rather than for selling them or mass production. You know she is going to be getting she is going to be forgotten with that because these were you know one-offs um, and in one case they were purchased by a museum uh, but again that same museum um, even though you know the evidence was very obvious has attributed it to somebody else so I think in that case it 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 really is your your survival is at the mercy of sort of who collects it and who sort of created it and who keeps it um, and that's really very dependent. Um, especially with regards to the involvement of private interests in artwork, um, especially families. You often see them being heavily involved with what's preserved and how it's preserved. So whether it's maintained in public galleries or whether it's kept in private collections, especially with Catherine Reed, a lot of her work was kept privately by the family and her letters. And that's been a key sticking point for her because her letters have been kept in private collections 
and now are lost, um, presumed possibly even destroyed. So to have that kind of extra involvement um, has meant that I think some artists, especially vulnerable, um, particularly women who often their artwork was then kept by the family because they thought it was a nice thing to have a work by a female family member, not necessarily that it had much of a financial value, but it was more sentimental. And for that reason, I think it's often that they've been lost because they're not displayed to the public and kept in kind of public discourse. Can I um, ask a question to Danielle, actually? It's kind of picking up on the, the points of when the art is, is and isn't lost. Do you think some of it is down to um, Rusi's kind of the view of her as almost a craftsperson rather than an artist? Do you think that that makes her more vulnerable to this? I, I kind of think about this in Roman terms that uh, quite often a lot of the art has been produced by cop you know copyists who obviously are highly skilled uh, but they're replicating the art you know sculptures from elsewhere and of course their names are completely completely invisible to us do you, do you think that's the case with with book binding and, and that sort of thing I, I think it that's absolutely the case because you know a book binding and especially the end papers that are inside a book where you literally have to open you know the front cover in order to find them those aren't going to be signed um and who created the book binding and who created the end papers is not even going to be listed sort of on the publishing information in the book. Um, so really the only time that that information is ever publicized is usually in when the book is being sold by booksellers. So that's really in the hands of booksellers who aren't even artists. So I think that's a very easy way for you to be completely forgotten. And I think that's largely what has happened with her because she, this really was sort of a crafts area and it was, very much done by women, but it was very acceptable to just sort of say, you know, look at these beautiful bindings and not mention who had made them. Thank you. So um, I want to come back just quickly on the, on the something Jessica highlighted on the fact that um, uh, in definitive history is a bit categorized and uh, artists and maybe women can be assigned to a specific category or uh, women's history or artistic history. It's, that's a thing that uh, we can discover when starting to study history, because if you start to uh, study a specific, a specialized part of history, you're not studying general history, so to speak. And there are questions about, yeah, but what do you know about main is history? So I think that uh, indeed um, that specification, so to speak, that can help to highlight specific uh, topics can also be a drawback and uh, lead, and can lead to the minorization or not maybe deletion, but yeah, maybe marginalization of uh, fears. Do you think that is the case too? Do you mean that by focusing on specific areas that that's a, a negative thing because it's kind of ignoring the broader picture? Yeah, I mean, the general perception that um, can be the case of you're studying uh, women's history, so you're not mm -hmm. studying general history, so you're studying a very specific part of history, which is, of course, false because yes, there is no such thing as general history, of course, but do you think that not studying general history as what it is referred by the, the, the public, uh, do you think that's uh, a liability in uh, surviving, uh, in your memory surviving? Um, I kind of reject the notion of working within women's history um, because a lot of the reading that I've had to do, especially about Catherine Reed, has been based around um, the women's movement um, and original kind of feminist histories of female artists that categorise them almost as a separate entity, trying to restore them to the male artistic canon. And I disagree with that approach because I think it's very um, reductive. It's suggesting that women existed by themselves when, as we've seen, Catherine Reed was um, mentored by two men. Um, she was painting alongside other men. She was commented upon by other men. So I agree with you that having a focus on solely women um, can be a drawback. Um, you have to look at the broader picture but in order to acknowledge that there's been a deletion, women's studies were useful to start off with to recognize those silences. 
then you also have to then return to the larger picture and go, okay, so we've now discovered this female figure. How can we integrate this into the existing historical narrative or revise how we view this period to appreciate the different things that were happening to different individuals, not solely on the basis of their gender, but also her class. Um, and also the fact that she was in exile and her status in different countries with their own different cultures. So it opens up a whole new realm of questions, which I don't think can be approached solely from a women's historical perspective. I think that's so interesting and I actually really agree. And I think now there's been a large sort of trend in sort of book history, bibliographic history, um, to really start to consider what the role of women and also not just women, but also of immigrant labor, of people of color and how they were involved in creating books. And that this isn't an issue of sort of, you know, women's studies, it's actually an issue of, you know, manufacture and how women were thought of, how their labor was thought of, uh, but that this is a part of how sort of the larger book creation that was always so sort of within the realm of men. And I think that there's a lot to be said about, you know, how we're bringing that sort of discussion back in, not just as a, you know, sort of look at this woman bookbinder, but to realize that a lot of bookbinding and, and, and papers were completely the, the realm of women who were being taught by other women. And I think that that sort of discussion is really important. I think it kind of looking at it in a the kind of wider sense of uh, kind of the zooming in on different uh, parts of history. I mean, the, the, the fact that the Roman period quite often does get studied as a, you know, a, a large sweeping history is what leads to characters like Juba being excised. There's just not room for uh, you know, to go into the detail of some of these histories, um, the some of these personal histories of, of these interesting characters. But then equally, would you want him to be uh, relegated to the margins of, you know, frontier studies when, which of course has its own baggage in the sense that, well, certainly Juba and Celine didn't think of their kingdom as a, on the frontier, they thought of it as at the heart of its own network of, you know, trade routes and, and policies and culture. I, I guess that's, that's not really not really answering your question Nicholas but just you know it's it is that it's that that risk of where do you where do you study these various characters do you, you know do you try and zoom right in on them but then in doing so in trying to highlight them and spotlight them do you then end up marginalizing them in a different way or do you leave them out of the, the these bigger narratives yeah uh, no problem about the question you are totally on point no problem about that so that that, that is uh, another yeah Another point that uh, that's interesting about the uh, specialization and the uh, resurgence of uh, uh, highlighting you know, specific uh, thematics and all, and the risk that are inherent to um, to such a process. However, in uh, however invaluable those uh, categorization and uh, highlighting of uh, forgotten views are, as we are doing now. And um, I wanted to come back to, um, to the fact that to specifically for Suzanne Roussy and Catherine Reed, many things that they uh, did that they made that uh, could have given us uh, an eye on them come from uh, personal papers and notes and private papers and notes. Um, how do you think, how, how do you feel about the fact that uh, main information we have about both Suzanne and Catherine were hidden in a way in personal papers and notes and how do you think we could uh, circumvent that vulnerability and uh, that, that is brought by the lack of public or at least well-known archives or records about someone or do you think that grain of mystery maybe could be um, an advantage and not a vulnerability in itself. Yeah, so I actually think, so in my case with Suzanne Rusi and me sort of stumbling across this envelope of her work, I think that that was actually a gift and a stroke of luck. So this is someone that if you wanted to say, oh, I'm gonna try to find you know, the works of female bookbinders in Paris, you know, this person, so Duncan Douglas, is not the person that you would sort of go in and say, well, I'm gonna look at his papers. So Finding them, you know, and as an archivist, I come across this all the time that, you know, women and, you know, marginalized people 
they're not going to have their own archive. So Suzanne Rusi died when she was 63, but as far as I can tell, for the last two decades of her life, she wasn't working. So by the time she died, there would be no archive that would say, oh, we want to collect her work, or we want to collect her letters, or even her husband, you know, who outlived her, would not say, I need to give her materials to an archive, because they likely wouldn't have been accepted. So finding them in these other people's archives can be such a way to sort of reconstruct uh, a person's life and to make up for that archival absence that we're really noticing now, you know, about women and about people of color and other marginalized people is that sometimes you can find these snippets and from those snippets, you know, great things can emerge. And that's sort of really what the point of my paper was and why I was so excited about it. So I think that that's actually really important. Unfortunately, um, it's sure much hard to hard. say that um, regarding Catherine Reed because I came at it from an undergraduate's perspective. I only knew what I wanted to look for in terms of trying to find um, a woman from a particular period. Didn't even know that I wanted to look for an artist, just thought that I wanted to look for a woman that was in Europe, but um, English or British. And then finding her, but then being told there were papers out there somewhere from someone's secondhand writing and then having to search for them being completely reliant on other people getting back to me. Um, and it ended up being one of her distant relatives um, contacting me, it being left completely up to them, whether I could access the materials, what I could find out about her, and the fact that most of those materials are still left with the family. I find it very hard to see the fact that it's remained in private collections is a good thing because I think that if it had been given to the public um, and put in a public um, archive, it would be so much easier for her to become better known. The fact that I'm the only person that's taken an interest in her for quite some time now, other than from a purely artistic perspective, looking at her paintings, I think that tells a lot. There's only so much that you can gather from letters written about her that are in um, public archives especially with the coronavirus, because all of these letters are still in physical form, not even scanned, so that you have to physically go to the archive. It's very hard to see this as like a positive thing. But I think that in the future, um, with the way that digitalization of archives is going, um, that's going to be less of a problem. So it'll be interesting to see how that changes over the next few years. So in a way, if I follow um, your reasoning, maybe you could say that um, being dependent on, uh, being remembered by private archives is a liability to be known by the public in general, but is in fact an advantage to uh, maybe attract the attention of historians of a school that wants, that want an interesting subject and that is more likely to choose you because, well, precisely there is very little and it's a bit thrilling to go and dig up a bit more. I think it's certainly almost a way of filtering who gets to write about them because you have to really want to find those papers, you have to really pursue it and that's going to deter quite a lot of people. So. It, it definitely narrows down the people that will be writing about them. I'm not sure whether it um, inspires people to do so, but it certainly did for me. <laughs> and I think in, in my case, I was, I'm very lucky because I am a librarian and I am an archivist and I do have the opportunity to sort of go through some of our collections that really aren't requested that often and aren't looked at that often. And I'm able to sort of find things like this and my institution really encourages us to look into these things. Um, but also the more that we know about them, the more that we can share when historians and researchers and even students come to us and say, you know, I'm interested in something like this, or I'm looking for a person like this. And these are things that we can pass on. So I think it's, it's a lot about that as well. Well, thank you very much for your participation and for your very interesting papers and very interesting questions and answers too. And uh, now, if you would like, you can have uh, maybe one or two minutes for personal remarks or conclusion uh, that you would like to share with uh, our viewers. I'd just like to thank my fellow panelists, um, uh, the chair, Nicholas, and to the organizers of this conference, as well as to both my doctoral cohorts and my supervisory team who've um, played a great role in, in the development of my um, interest in Juba the second and, and my studies so far.
Thank you. Um, I likewise would like to thank um, all of the fellow panelists and the organisers of this panel. Um, also, a special thank you to my supervisor at Oxford and also to DR Torrance, who has provided me with um, the information that I've needed to do most of my research into Catherine Reed. So thank you all. I'd like again to thank uh, the organizers of this conference, as well as my fellow panelists and everybody involved. I thought that this was a fantastic conversation and it, I really enjoyed hearing about your artists and sort of figures as well. I really want to thank uh, the library that I work at, the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library, for encouraging me to conduct my own research. Uh, and also to thank the Bibliographic Society of Canada, which I'm a member of, who really got me sort of thinking about female bookbinders and sort of, you know, their absence in history. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone involved. And I would like to, to thank the um, conference organizers, of course, and my fellow panelists who have provided us with um, fantastic papers. And uh, if you have any more questions about the things we have discussed today, you can always um, ask them directly to the panelists on the AMA that we will be hosting on Reddit. And you will find all information on the uh, video description. Thank you very much.